This video was supported by an educational grant from Healthmark. Hi, I'm Christina Hopkins. My work is in environmental health and infectious disease, and I'm the research manager at Ofsted & Associates, which is a company that specializes in conducting real-world research to support improvements in patient safety and occupational health. Today, I'm going to be talking about cleaning verification tests and tools for use in flexible endoscopes. So you may have heard that there's a big update to ANSI AMI ST91, and now cleaning verification tests are required every time for all high-risk endoscopes and regularly for everything else. These recommendations are strengthened due to the tremendous amount of evidence from our group and others that fully processed reusable endoscopes are frequently still contaminated with soil, and that cleaning verification tests are one way to check if manual cleaning actually worked. So today I'm going to introduce you to the types of cleaning verification tests and walk through a few methods for sampling your scopes. Okay, so when we think about biochemical tests that can determine if scopes are clean, there's really two buckets. First, there are tests that can determine if there's still soil by detecting protein, hemoglobin, which is blood, carbohydrates, or ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. And this is a chemical that's released by living cells. Second, there are tests that can detect bioburden, like germs, including microbial cultures, or rapid tests that can detect certain germs called gram-negative bacteria that are generally considered to be the bad guys when they're on scopes. For today, we're going to focus on the soil indicators because cleaning is supposed to get rid of the soil before HLD or sterilization to help them work better. And tests for bioburden come a little bit later in the process. So which biochemical test to use depends on the type of results that you want. Qualitative tests involve indicator strips or fluid in a vial that changes color when soil is present. The tech sees and interprets that color change, which can depend on the tech as well as lighting in the room. And that's why it's called qualitative. They're looking at a visible quality and it's subject to interpretation. Quantitative tests, on the other hand, measure a specific amount of soil. They may still rely on detecting a light or a color change, but the results are read by sensitive machines that provide a numerical result. Now, I'm gonna talk about a few tests that Ofsted has used during our research, but I wanna note that I'm not endorsing any particular products here. The point is that you should use whatever tests meet your needs and that your team can use consistently and correctly. So let's start with the channel check test from Healthmark, which involves dipping a test strip into a sample of water that's run through a channel. And this is also called effluent. The test strip has three little pads that can detect carbohydrates, protein, and blood. And it comes with a little card that tells you what a new test strip looks like when it has no residue. So this is before you dip it in your sample. And it also shows you what it looks like when the uh, sample contains substantial soil with positive scores here for carbohydrates, protein, and blood. So as you can see, when we tested samples, the middle strip wasn't dunked at all, so it had no residue, while the top strip detected carbohydrates and blood, but no protein. Can you see how that middle test pad is still white? And finally, the bottom test strip strongly detected all three, showing that there was a lot of soil present. Now, a scope where any pad turns colors should be re-cleaned because it's still dirty, even if it doesn't have all three types of soil present. We've also tried a protein test from Steris called ResiTest, which involves combining a sample with chemicals called reagents in a little vial and putting it into a little cardboard box with a negative control over here on the left, a positive control, which is this blue liquid in the middle. And then the instructions say to compare those to the instrument test, but we found that it was hard to interpret because there were shadows in the box and the color change was just a little bit muddy. We tried holding the vials against a sheet of paper, and that made it look pretty blue, but it was still tricky trying to hold all three vials at the same time. Healthmark also has tests that can detect protein or hemoglobin harvested using either swabs or effluent. So to do these, you use a little pipette to mix a small amount of effluent and a chemical reagent that changes color whenever it's exposed to that targeted soil. Once you have your sample, you can compare it to a color chart to see if there's residual protein. So in this photo, we've got um, the fluid in the vial was a bright blue, which tells us that it was substantially 
protein was present, more than 30 micrograms per milliliter. And now if you look at this color chart, it's pretty easy to distinguish between the negative, which is that yellow arrow on the left, yellow green, greenish blue, and finally blue at that 30 micrograms per milliliters or more. But above that, the blues all tend to look the same to us. Luckily, you can also read ProCheck test files with a spectrophotometer, and this is what we've done during our research studies. So once the sample was prepared, we just popped it into the machine, and it produced a numeric or a quantitative result that is read in micrograms per milliliter. Now, we love these quantitative machines for research because we really like getting that number, but color charts are likely more than sufficient for day-to-day -day use. Another quantitative method that we've used uh, is for ATP testing. And here we're using 3M's clean trace ATP swabs to take samples from the insertion tube and control handle of a boroscope. The swab is then placed in a little sleeve or tube that contains chemicals that actually emit light when they contact soil. So for this test to work, you've got to mix it up before you place it in the luminometer, and then you'll get a numeric reading of the ATP level based on how much light was emitted. And that's why you'll see this often measured as RLU, or relative light units. You can also do ATP tests of effluent by flushing the channel with a sterile water, and then dunking that little wand in the sample before placing it in the luminometer for analysis. Now this wand has little ridges on the end that get filled with effluent, so it's important to hold the wand straight up and down so that none of those droplets fall off when you're inserting it into that sleeve. Okay, so now we know of a few different kinds of tests we can do, but what are we testing? Endoscopes kind of look like big garden hoses on the outside, but they're pretty complicated on the inside. And the new Amy ST91 standard says that testing should include at a minimum, monitoring of that big instrument suction channel, which means you've got to figure out how to take samples from inside your scopes. And luckily you've got a few options for that. One easy thing to do is to flush the channel with sterile water and that's where we get that effluent. You can collect the effluent using a little Ziploc bag that gets attached to the distal end or in a urine cup or other sterile sample collection tube. And one way to get some extra value out of your cleaning verification test is to actually inspect your effluent before running your tests on it. If it's discolored or you can see particles or chunks, that scope is not clean. In fact, this is a beaker full of alcohol that had been flushed through a fully processed scope to dry it, which is why we were surprised to see that it had red chunks in the fluid. And that's not the only time we've observed chunks. The effluent in this urine cup had several chunks of tissue or mucus that got flushed out-ish. You never know what's inside those channels, and this is why cleaning verification is so important. You can also pass a channel brush or a swab or sponge through the channel. Residual soil will stick to it, and then you can test that swab or that brush tip. In the first picture, the team used a channel brush to take samples from a pediatric colonoscope. And this one shows a swab that we passed through a bronchoscope. Now, just like with your effluent, inspect your swabs and brushes before doing your tests because you can see that this swab is covered in black gunk. Now, it goes without saying that anything with visible soil in your effluent or in your swabs should be considered dirty no matter how your cleaning verification test turns out. And now, although the new standards say we have to do tests to make sure that that instrument channel is clean, we also think it's important to make sure that the outside of the scopes are clean too. In our research studies, we've conducted tests to detect soil on distal ends, bending sections and insertion tubes, as well as control handle, uh, control handle components like the ports, valve housings, and the control handle itself. Now, when you think about sampling the distal ends, keep in mind that there are big differences between scopes like urology scopes, Bronx, big GI scopes like colonoscopes, and ultrasound scopes like EBIS and EUS scopes. That means that something that seems as simple as taking a sample from the distal end can open up a total can of worms because swabs that fit in nooks and crannies on some scopes might not fit into others. So that's something to keep in mind. So to wrap up, 
When we're trying to decide which cleaning verification tests to use, there are several factors to consider. First, there's the sensitivity of the test or its ability to detect tiny amounts of soil. You should also consider the ease of use, and there's three aspects of this. The process for actually taking the samples, the steps involved in the testing, and the methods for interpreting the results, whether it's that quantitative or that qualitative interpretation. You'll also want to consider the resources you're going to need, including space, equipment, and cost, including consumable materials. And lastly, it's important to consider the preferences and the capabilities of your team, so the technicians and the managers who are going to be responsible for the day-to-day -day implementation of cleaning verification testing. This video is an excerpt from a free one-hour continuing education webinar available on our educational portal. You might also be interested in checking out our webinar on biofilm, our YouTube video on residual contamination, or our peer-reviewed publications describing Ofsted's cleaning verification findings during real-world studies. All of these are linked in the video description. And thanks for joining me today. For more information, visit our website or contact us by email at education at ofstedinsights.com. This video was made possible by an educational grant from Healthmark, who also provided pro-check and channel check materials for several of our studies. Please contact Healthmark directly for further information about tools for performing cleaning verification tests at www.hmark.com. Finally, here is a list of disclaimers that you should review prior to making any changes to device processing practices at your facility.